Thank you very much, Annette, and dear colleagues. I'm going far up in the north, in the north of Scandinavia. When the Roman vessels moved beyond the Limes and far up north, they often became subject to material mutations, and not least, their functions and contexts of use were essentially altered. A frequent way of using Roman vessels in Scandinavia was a scenery urns. This paper discusses a few Roman vessels, mainly the so-called Westland cauldrons in Scandinavian contexts. My aim is to encourage more research on transformations of, uh, on Roman vessels during their journeys in time and space, but also on how they tangibly have been active in changing local practices, material objects and burial customs, and hopefully also social relations. We know too little about this. But there are some good examples for further inspiration. My survey therefore builds on earlier and recent literature, together with my own questions and some conclusions. Tradition labels the Western cauldron as Roman import. But now scholars mainly agree that circulation of vessels is much more complex than to be used to general imports. Instead, we, we are used to uh, keywords like encounters, third space, creolization and hybridization of material things and of practices and customs. Influence is, of course, by post-colonial fields, not least Homi Baba, the location of culture, but also several other scholars. A few colleagues only have used these lines in the studies of Roman vessels in Scandinavia. Some, a little more on the vessels. The Westland cauldrons were produced in Germania Inferior. Uh, most scholars think in Namur area, mainly during the third century AD. Metallurgi metallurgical analysis show that some of them are made of copper and others of tin bronze alloy. Originally, they most likely were for military canteens. Uh, at least 120, 130 of them are found in Scandinavia and mostly then used with cremations, occasionally in inhumations and very seldom in hordes, as a contrast to the continent. Their name, Western Cauldron, derives from the fact that most of them were first found in the western parts of Scandinavia, in western Norway, and uh, the uh, Old archaeologist Ingvar Unset named them Western Cauldrons already in 1880. Scandinavian contexts of use of burial are within the 4th to 6th centuries. So, when used as urn, the vessels were old, maybe about 200 years old. So. Most find of Western Cauldrons were made long ago and professional documentation in situ is not frequent. But to which burial cairns or mound they belong is usually known. Uh, the slim cauldrons often are deposited in big mounds or cairns, often as secondary burials in old mounds, sometimes in mounds built already in the Bronze Ages. Uh, their content, this is uh, Example of typical equipment, local bone and small metal things, uh, belt fittings and small uh, copies of Roman coins, uh, ceramics, and it varies very much. And uh, bones, it's burnt bones of humans. Uh, very few of them are osteologically uh, examined, but uh, they show um, a very wide variation in uh, to biological gender and to age. Uh, some of them are double graves, and many of them are big mixed human bones and, uh, and uh, animal bones. And the most frequent animal is the bear. Bear claws is the most frequent animal representation in them. There are no weapons in these Western cauldron cremations. There are a few examples of bone arrows, but many scholars uh, have uh, named them uh, uh, working equipment 
instead of weapons. So, so I don't know. This is also another uh, example of equipment where this uh, basin was placed over the, the cauldron with the burnt bones. But my old colleagues uh, took the, the burials apart, the things apart, and photographed it. The separate things. This is too early. <coughs> The most extensive work on Westland cauldrons as objects is by Osa Darlene Haukin, who presented an additional a new typology. There are many others, not least Eggers, old. There are also many, many others. But these are maybe the two uh, explicitly classic uh, typology, typology studies. So, as many scholars have studied the typology and cauldron types and forms, I thought I would focus on different aspects, uh, on ways in which cauldron burials were constructed in detail. An important observation I first made in museums and in literature was that all of the Western cauldrons with cremation residues are different to each other in display of materials and bones and in burial construction. This was also how I could relate them to the discussion of encounters between foreign and local and try to think of them as in a third space, a space where a differentiation, where changes and hybridization could have taken place. It is very clear that they changed function and, and uh, forms in many ways. There are many material changes. Some of the, cha the columns got new ears, new handles, and many of them are patched many times, so many as 12 times. Uh, some of the columns got a new bottom. Uh, on some of the columns, the neck is shortened, and so on. There are many small. I think they are, uh, uh, they are repairs, reparations. But not only, I think also it is because there was an idea that the chain, the columns should be altered, taken care of and altered and got a new life for until it was used in its last context, namely the body. <coughs> Uh, the issue of Roman import has traditionally been an emblematic theme in Scandinavian archaeology. But around the change of millennium, a few younger scholars took up this post-colonial inspiration, uh, not least Terje Östegård, uh, Lotta Fernstål, Fredrik Ekengren, to name some of the most <coughs> important names in Scandinavian context. And I think they also were inspired by Peter van Dominen and Jane Webster, who were very early on taking up uh, uh, colonization discussions, uh, hybridization and creolization in uh, uh, Roman burial, in a uh, Roman context, in uh, outside, just outside the, the Limes and in the Limes area. But the ideas of material influence is not new. Uh, there were some old archaeologists who had the, the ideas that Western cauldrons were changed and that they were um, hybrid in some way. For example, one of the, um, the Nestor old archaeologists, Anders Lorang in uh, Norway, thought that the Westland cauldron was produced in Norway and by the influence of impulses from the Roman Empire, combined with influences from local handled ceramic pots. Another among the old archaeologists, Håkon Schettelig, excavated one of the cauldrons with cremations, and he named it, in fact, a hybrid burial custom. That was because he thought it was hybrid, because the bones were cleaned, and the uh, similarly cauldron was surrounded by ashes and burnt bones. There was a combination of two burial customs, he thought, and they, that, therefore it was a, burial, a hybrid burial custom. Yes, 
so and I think this was a very good idea but the old archaeologists did not tell from where they had their ideas of hybridity but as you think that Schrettlich's work was published in 1912 it must be suspected that he had some influence from general cultural history thoughts about hybrids and races and such things. Maybe. We do not know, but I think there must have, could have been some influences. So there are many threads to take up and to go on with. Uh, I have Choose, chosen to test, look a little more on uh, Lotta Fanstol's good example from Ficklinge in eastern Sweden. She has studied this, this um, in uh, detail. It's not the Western Cauldron, it is an Apollogranus vase used as an urn in Scandinavia. And she thought of the whole process of uh, making this into a burial urn as a very long creolization process. She's the very first one in uh, Scandinavia to take this mm -hmm. term to this uh, group of imports. This is another example. This is so-called Estland cauldron. This is also a Roman temple vessel in Scandinavia used as an urn. There is also a question of um, how this cauldron form could have um, influenced other forms, such as ceramic pots. You could say that some of these ceramic pots have, have a um, um, similar profile as Westland cauldrons, and you could say that this little silver cup also has, is a small Westland cauldron. But it might be a uh, fantasy. I don't know. So, um, to sum up, uh, my summary and prospects are that my aim is to participate in a discussion of Roma influences far north of the Limas. We have su substantial knowledge about the number of vessels and the local ways of use in Scandinavia, but less knowledge about specific encounters in which vessels are involved and on their impacts on social conditions. There is therefore a gap in knowledge about how Roman vessel influenced social relations in Scandinavia. This is such as organizational practices in the preparation and cremation of the deceased and in construction of a grave and about burial work according to social relations, gender, age and skills. But it is obvious that such small encounters, their materialities and their negotiations were important to general changes in social conditions traditionally supposed to have affected Roman Iron Ages in Scandinavia. Locals with Western cauldrons used with cremations are usually far away from the rich Danish context, of course, and also far away from the Scanians, such as Upokra, and, as we just saw from Öland and Gotland context, they are very, very different and maybe poor in, compar in comparison to them. They are just different, and I just want to talk about difference. It is generally recognized that northern Scandinavia was of interest to the continent because of the fur-bearing animals, and that it should be reasonable, and reasonable explanation why Roman vessels are far, found far north, in North Sweden, in, uh, not so much in northern Norway, and not much in northern Finland, but in, uh, in uh, northern middle Sweden there are a few of them. But we do not know much about how, on the details of how they came up to the north of Middelpad and how they, how they were changed social relations. To get more detailed knowledge about how different Scandinavian areas related to the Roman Empire, 
I think it's fruitful to continue detailed study of small contexts and practices and look for differences and variation to be compared to each other between sites. I tried a practice approach in my earlier studies. They gave some knowledge about details in burial constructions, but not much on how encounters looked like. This is still a big question. My investigation tried to change in approach and in methods by analysis of practices and differences between locales. I think that the better development of relational perspectives on contexts with Roman vessels in Scandinavia is an interesting challenge, combined with approaches already present, like good frameworks like context of action and chain operatoire, and such useful good approaches and frameworks already tried in other contexts. Uh, I think, except those um, earlier studies by Lotta Fanstol and Östigård and Fredrik Ekengren, uh, studies on uh, cauldrons in Scandinavia are rather traditional. So there is quite an interesting field to go into with some of the new, new um, theories and methods of how to study practices and the social action. So I think this is the most the content of what I would like to say. So thank you very much.